Welcome to this week's episode of How Things Work and in the next two segments we'll be looking at how tires achieve their grip and to add a twist to the subject we'll be comparing car and bike tires and how they achieve grip in completely different ways. So first let's have a look at car tires. The major difference between a car and a bike tire is that a car tire does very little leaning. The other obvious difference is that a car with four tires suffers from weight transfer which loads and unloads the various tires differently at the same time. What affects the available grip on a car tire? Well aside from the type of tire and the tread we have on it, downforce, weight and road surfaces, there are dynamic forces that act on a tire which influence the amount of remaining grip we have. And the best way to illustrate this is with cam circle. So as we can see with cam circle, we can illustrate longitudinal forces, so braking and acceleration, and then our lateral forces which occur due to our steering. So if the diameter of the circle represents the maximum grip levels that we have in our tires, and let's say that is expressed as 10, if we do braking, for example, just by itself, we might create a longitudinal force of 7 out of 10, but you can still see that that's well within our grip levels. Or we might accelerate with a force equal to 7 out of 10, and we still have grip levels. However, if we brake and steer at the same time, so let's say we steer with a lateral force of 7 out of 10, we brake with a lateral force of 7 out of 10, the resultant force between those two vectors will put us outside the total grip levels that are available in our tires. And that is where we lose grip. So it's critical that we understand how the various loads acting on our tires when we are accelerating, braking and steering will affect overall grip. Now that we know how the lateral and longitudinal forces use up the grip, we now need to consider that the inside wheels travel a shorter distance relative to the outside wheels when cornering and how this affects our steering grip. We know intuitively that because the inside and outside wheels turn through different radii, one of the tires has to slip. And a lot of design work has been done to reduce the effects of the wheel slip with designs such as the Ackerman steering which is a special geometric design of the steering linkages allowing for the front wheels to pivot at slightly different angles when turning. But here's the interesting part. We still need a little slip to get some grip. Not too much because that's a skid. <laughs> I'm a poet and I don't know it. But for this to make sense we first need to explain that there is a difference between friction and traction. So friction is a force that develops between your tires and the road and it can be static or kinetic. You can't see it but you can feel it and, it and observe its impact on your driving. That said, friction can impact your entire car's handling. Traction specifically describes the type of friction that develops between your tires and the road. Without traction your car can't develop tire grip with the road and you can rapidly lose control of your car. However, given the design and construction of our tires, there is always a little movement between the tire and the surface, which occurs especially as the tread blocks settle as they make contact with the road. On top of that, the carcass of the tire itself twists when we turn the steering wheel, and this causes the center of the tire to be misaligned relative to the leading and rear edge of the tire, which causes slippage to occur. You can see that combined with our Ackerman steering angle, we have a lot of movement between the contact patches of the tire and the surfaces of the road. But as long as the movement is not more than the traction the tire generates, we'll be able to maintain control of the car and not lose grip. A major challenge we face, of course, are the various conditions under which we drive our cars. Between wet and dry surfaces, contaminants on the road, and different road surfaces, our poor tires must cope with all these conditions. And this is why all passenger cars have tread patterns. Now there's many a debate that has taken place about tire treads, but before getting into the details, remember that there are different types of tires whose shape and tread are dependent on the task they are required to perform. 
So you'll notice that with a performance tyre, it's usually a square tyre which assists with a crisp turn into the corner. It also tries to maximise grip with little emphasis on displacing water, whereas wet weather tyres use an even softer rub rubber compound than performance tyres to create as much mechanical grip as possible. They also have more siping to displace as much water as possible, which anyone who has slipped on a wet floor wearing slops will certainly appreciate. All weather tyres are what you typically find on most production cars. They're designed to be a compromise between grip and performance, longevity, noise, wet weather and safety. For increased tyre life, they're made up with an even harder rubber compound which sacrifices outright grip and cornering performance. The tread block design is normally a compromise between quiet running and water dispersion, so the tyre should not be too noisy in normal conditions, but should work fairly well in downpours and on wet roads. All-terrain tyres are typically used on SUVs and buckies. They are much larger tyres with stiffer sidewalls and bigger tread block patterns. The larger tread blocks mean the tyres are very noisy on normal roads, but grip loose sand and dirt very well with almost a gear interlocking type of process to create grip. As well as being noisier, the larger tread block pattern means less tyre surface in contact with a smooth road surface like tyre. The rubber compound used in these tyres is normally middle of the road, so neither soft nor hard. And at the extreme end of the all-terrain tyre classification are mud tyres. And these have massive, super chunky tread blocks and really shouldn't ever be driven anywhere else other than on loose mud and dirt. And the tread sometimes doesn't even come out in blocks anymore, but looks more like paddles built into the tyre carcass. So you thought the tread was the shape of the rubber blocks around the outside of your tyre, didn't you? Well, it is, but it is also, as you can see, so much more. The proper choice of tread design for a specific application can mean the difference between a comfortable, quiet ride and a tyre that leaves you feeling exhausted whenever you get out of your car. A proper tread design improves traction, improves handling and increases durability. It also has a direct effect on the ride comfort, noise level and fuel efficiency of the tyre. We also need to keep in mind the importance of correct tyre pressures to suit the conditions. Correct tyre pressures ensure the structure of the tyre and the consequential grip it provides is retained. And pressure also influences the heating and cooling of the tyre, which also impacts on how the tyre compound provides grip. So that's a basic look on how car tyres achieve and retain their grip. Next week we'll make the comparison with bike tyres and I can't wait because the way bike tyres create grip is a fascinating concept to say the least. So we look forward to seeing you then.